We praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Brother Herman. It's a joy to see a senior citizen with so much power and love for God. God is good. Praise the Lord. And all you wonderful all people. Lord. Yeah, all you wonderful people. Welcome again to the RTOD. God is good. It's such a wonderful God. I can see the joy of my King in your faces. Right? We had, we had the prayers, we had the worship. Now we're going to have the Word of God. And I'm very proud and privileged to have my brother, Brother Jeremy Kevely, to minister the Word. All right, he's from JMC Ministries. He's doing a lot of work. He has got a lot of uh, YouTube material where he speaks and he's gone for interviews. I let him speak for himself. Just a reminder to him that Malaysia will be celebrating the National Day on the 31st of August. Go ahead, my dear brother. Speak what the Lord has laid upon your heart. God bless you. God bless you and thank you, Pastor Robert. It is an honor and privilege to come and join all of us on our time, all of us in Malaysia, across Asia, across the globe, as people are watching this, uh, different places. Uh, and sharing the message of God as this is a 24-7 prayer room. So there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes and in person that you see that you may not see. Someone's praying for you that you may not even have met. And that's kind of connected to what I'm wanting to talk about today. So I've been studying different things to get prepared for this message. And it's been a quite busy week. Uh, this week of everything that's happened with the different places that I've seen what God is doing. And there's a couple of stories about God's faithfulness. Christopher Wan says God's faithfulness is proved not by the elimination of hardships, but carrying us through the circumstances that we go through. And I don't know about you, but if you look in the Old Testament and you look in the New Testament, you look in Revelation, it talks about Christians will become weary. We will be so busy, the closer we get to end times, that we're going to be mentally and physically exhausted. And as the Holy Spirit starts removing itself from planet Earth, we that are left will be leaving a remnant for those that are in the future, as I spoke before. And there's different things that happen in our lives that we don't always understand. Uh, Christopher learned that if you don't give up on people who have... When you have love in their heart, you just keep praying. I don't know about you, but I have friends and family members and coworkers that are not saved. They're, they're, you know, they're older, they're younger. We've tried multiple years to, to pray and it's gotten to a point where we're not praying, we're not listening. And when that happens, you fall to the wayside on on what happens and what you miss out on and if you do that too many times we'll miss on exactly what's happening so christopher his story was he turned his back on his family he turned he, he embraced drugs he went he went in promiscuity he was in rebellion he, went, he became homosexual he and his mother who was struggling in a failed marriage she kills herself but a minister comes along and gives, gives, gives her a pamphlet about God's love, something that she wants to kill herself. She wants to die. She's, and she reads this information and finds out, you know, God has something for her that she's just never heard before. So this long out journey goes on where a mother who prayed and trusted God to save the son, but he kept running. Christopher kept running further into all this ridiculousness in his life. But because someone went through and continued to want to focus in on what God wanted to do, the victory came about. And what happens is the lives are transformed and lives are saved. But this doesn't happen on its own. These kinds of stories don't happen all by themselves. Or like someone else shares from China about a sixth generation Christian faith story. Someone someone in a uh, small fishing village 
South China, missionaries come to preach the gospel in the early 1900s. Now, I preached a sermon the other day about end times cross connection. And to briefly cover a little bit about that, I talked about what is the importance today with what we're doing. Can you take a piece of paper and draw a line and connect the dots from when the missionaries first came to your country to what's happening now and then draw another line of where it's going to go in the future? And pieces of that information, it's more specifically what you and your ministry and your associated ministries and other ministries you know, other Christians that you know, what can you save physically, digitally, and by memory could be passed to the future. Because the reason why Christianity may fail in a certain area is not just because Christians died off or because a culture changed or because somebody made another decision and did something different. It's because somebody decided to just stop and put a hold on talking about Jesus. Whether you're in prison, whether you are in home, whether you are somewhere else, you can still talk about Jesus. You can still pray to Jesus. You can still pray to people if you're stuck in prisons. Think about what Paul did and others did. They kept praying. Think about the, the Christians right now that are in prison for their faith around the globe. As they're praying for you and me. Maybe not by name. But they, if they know, think about a country, they'll pray for that country. Sometimes they'll pray for you know a different ministry. That God's will will be done. But in this story here, in the early 1900s, this person's great-great-grandfather became the first of three people in a village to believe in God. The aunts and uncles graduated from a school that took special care of the family, and the mother had good grades but dropped out of junior school to work because they had so many family members. And they, she remembers growing up and, and riding a bicycle to see mom and and following back to grandma's house. And it's just a regular routine of, you know, going to church Saturday afternoon, watching the grandmother clean and sing hymns and, you know, clean the floor, wipe the pews, clean them off the table, wipe the table. And so when she was like nine, she went to a church in John City in Gong province and listened to a pastor. And we found out the grandmother was actually lost. And the mom comforted her and just wanted to find out, you know, what exactly can be done? How can, how can we help? How can we transform this? And soon as she enters the door, because her grandmother was seriously ill this day, she's here singing, trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in the Lord, but to trust and obey, obey. Think about that, trusting and obeying with what God wants to do and how he's allowing people to pray and, and finding things out and moving different places. Suffering from the same disease, the grandmother passed away two months after illness. And the grandfather lived this healthy life for, all, for like 10 years being cured of a disease. But when they got the strength to want to move forward, they kept going into building new churches and going to new villages and going to different places. And then in the testimony later on, because of this new church coming about, he says, I love my church and I miss it with my prayers. I will work harder for church ministries until I can do no more. You ever had a great grandparent or a friend or a teacher or a, a leader or somebody that wanted to stand in the gap for you like we do here 24 by 7 and there's multiple houses of prayers there's multiple online ones and those in person that uh, people are praying for you there's people that are you know trying to transform what you're doing and where you're going and how you want to operate and what God says and how God is But what about you that say, I just don't, I can't do it. I don't have the skill set. Um, I don't know what to do, where to go. I'm just, or maybe you, you, you've had those skills and you've done stuff and you're, you run into some kind of wall. If you look at Judges 6.15, Judges 6.15. 
and says, Pardon me, my lord. Gideon replied, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So in this moment, the Israelite, having this conversation, talking to God, and he's having, if you look at verse 7, an angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak and uproar that belonged to Joseph the Arabite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat and wine press to keep it from the Mennonites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That was what was said before verse 15. And then in verse 16, it says, The Lord answered, I will be with you, and I will strike down all of the Mennonites, leaving none alive. And then Gideon replies as he finds favor. He said, give me a sign that you're really talking to me. Have you ever sat around and thought and wondered, or wherever you are, right before you're going to bed, you just woke up, you had a dream, going somewhere else, and you're like, God, show me a sign. You ever said that? Show me a sign. I need a sign. And in verse 18, he says, Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. So then there in the beginning, in verse 19, he talks about preparing a young goat, and he takes care of things. And in verse 20, he's talking with the angel again. He tells him to take the meat and the bread and place them on this rock and pour out the broth. So the angel of the Lord touches the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire comes out from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord uh, disappears. He's just gone. Then Gideon realizes it was an angel of the Lord. He says, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But remember what he said earlier. He was still scared, was he not? Verse 23 says, The Lord says to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. Have you ever thought, maybe you weren't necessarily going to die, but you thought, I'm going to fail the test. I can't do this. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can't get where I need to be. I can't be the way you want me to be. You're just frustrated and you're like, what am I supposed to do? I can't do this. I'm stuck. I, I, I can't get where I need to be. I can't be the way you want me to be. So Gideon builds an altar at, to the Lord there and he calls it the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands upper as a bear's eyes. So that night, the Lord tells him, take the second bull from your father's herd, one of the seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asher pole beside it. And then build the proper kind of altar to your Lord, your God, on the top of this height. Use the wood of the Asher pole you cut down to offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So in the morning, the town gets up. Now think about this. Have you ever done something and you didn't tell anybody? I have multiple examples of that. Why did I stay at both homeless shelters for so long? I never told anybody. How about where where different things are happening for, you know, things in school? Like, why am I walking around carrying a Bible? Why am I writing a sermon in school? Um, why am I, you know, making these posts? Why am I up at different hours of the night writing people, talking to different things? Why am I submitting 40 plus ideas at a job that can't be fixed until multiple months or years in the future? Maybe, you know, you clean something up. Maybe like the story I told the other day about the angry person and they plowed the side and they took care of that. So all the people come together in verse 29 and they ask each other, who did this? Who? Wh what's going on here? What's happening? And they investigate, just like, you know, good military person, good lawyer, good, good, good mother. If you have a good mother, good mother is just as, just as powerful as any 
a FBI agent or any military person. They will hunt you down. They will learn the questions and they will talk and wear you out until you get everything figured out. If you have a good mother, a mother will do that. And they find that Gideon, the son of Joash, did this. And the people of the town demands Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he broke down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So all this crowd is around and all these things are happening. And Joash says, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal is really a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his offer. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerubbaal that day saying, let Baal contend with him. So now the Mennonites and Amalites and Eastern peoples, they all join forces. They cross over the Jordan and camp on the valley of Jezreel. And then the spirit of the Lord comes on Gideon. He blows his trumpet, summoning the Ezraite to follow him. He sends messengers all throughout and they go up and meet him. Then Gideon says to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look. I will place a wool fleece on threshing floor. There is dew only on the fleece, and all the ground is dry. He wakes up the next day, he squeezes it, and the fleece out, wrung out of the dew. It's a bowl full of water. And then Gideon says to God, Do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Have you ever had a moment where like, you think you just got to make one more request to God? You just have to ask that question one more time. Let's test the fleece again. Make it dry. Let the ground be covered with dew. So that night God did. How many times do we need signs? Before, like in Judges 7, to summarize it, he defeats the Midianites. But think about all the things that he had to go through before he was prepared for that. He asked for a sign, but then he ends up meeting multiple signs. And he eventually, you know, destroys and defeats them. Verse 22 of chapter 7. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord calls the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Now, when the Lord is fighting for you and with you, it's known and common that, God, I need a sign. That's okay. But many times when things are going wrong and things are happening, God will cause those that are against you to be confused, to, to fall apart. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Or maybe God's more specific, like Acts 8.26, Philip and the Ethiopian. says, now an angel of the Lord says to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Sometimes God will specifically tell you, this is where you need to go. And this is what you need to do. Only thing God told me at the shelter is he says, I want you to stay here until, you know, you go to your, your, your mission trip and you move on. I want you to stay here for well over a year because this is where God wants you to be. And you're not allowed to tell anybody what I told you. Just keep collecting your $25 a week. And when it's time to go, I will let you know and you call your aunt. And that's what I did. And I told nobody at the Salvation Army. I told no family. I told no friends. It's the first time I'm ever talking about it. I did what God said. He said, stay and wait. There's people that need you. I said, okay, I'll stay and wait. And he says, if you try stuff, apply for jobs and do different things, it's all going to fail because I don't want you to go anywhere yet. But as I said earlier, people are afraid. When we get this fear, we always ask God for a sign. When we're confused, we ask God for a sign. When we don't know, we ask God for a sign. When we do know, we still ask God for a sign. Why? Because this flesh, this, this body is operating in the physical realm and it doesn't want to submit to God. It's almost like someone's holding your hand and you can't move it. But the spiritual realm and the physical realm is in a constant war with your flesh. Regardless, if you just got saved, you've been a Christian for 50 plus years, there's still going to be some kind of warring with your flesh and your spirit on something.
But of course we know the Psalm 27. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? But that fear, that fear seems to encompass us. And it keeps us from being able to do what God has called us to do. And that's quite dangerous. Very dangerous. But if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. It says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. But I need a sign. Sometimes you'll get a sign and sometimes you won't. But I'm quite confident if you do get that one sign from the Lord and you do have an angel of the Lord peer from you and the angel of the Lord comes before you and makes decisions and things in your life, You'll never forget that. But the devil's going to try and come and make you doubt, to make you be confused, to make you be frustrated, and make you to not want to continue to go forward. Again, as I talked about in another message, an end times cross connection. What are we doing now that's going to leave us to the future? How do we gather more people to come to a broadcast or come to a church or or get involved in something. Or uh, maybe we are living in an area where the Holy Spirit is not very much present. And there are different places across the globe you can say that. What is it? As we celebrate Malaysia, the 31st of August, what do we as Christians want to see in Malaysia? What do we want to see in Asia? What do we want to see in Africa? What do we want to see in the Americas? In the European countries? What, what is it we want to see God do? Where is it we want to go? If we are working and we're working together to fulfill the Great Commission, we're seeing what God wants to do. We will be like 1 Corinthians 4 verses 12 through 13. Now, obviously, you're going, you might want to ask for a sign. You might want to fleece. You might want to pray. You might want to fast and worship and all these kinds of things continuously. But as this says, verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 12 and 13. We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. We are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. When we become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world right up to this moment. So we will be persecuted for the things that we go through. There will be people that will treat us like we are literal garbage. Like we are the mildew left on stones. is they say that a kind word rips off wrath. That's in the psychological world, the sociological world, and in the Christian world. And lots of other non-religions and religions, for those that have that kind of belief, say that works. But the thing is, the only one that actually sticks and causes a complete change of everything is a Christian moving forward, doing what God has called him to do in the middle of those moments. When things are going wrong, you have that opportunity to, to be that ambassador for Christ, to be that missionary, to be that worship leader, to be, be that steward, to be that servant, that co-worker. 
Because the Bible talks about, do not let the sun go down while you are angry. Do not let these things take hold and take captive of who we are. In the end times cross connections, the moments that we're in right now, celebrating what's going to happen next, we have to be prepared for, for the days to come. And if you're truly excited about Jesus today, you're truly excited about what God wants to do. You're truly wanting to see where God is. Think about what the disciples did in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapters 4, verses 10 through 20. And to summarize this. They talk about in verse 12 that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. And in verse 13, they see the courage of Peter and John realize these were unschooled, ordinary men. But they were astonished and they took note because these men had been with Jesus. Now, while, yes, you and I have not physically been with Jesus, I know that. And they could see the man, you know, he that healed them standing there with them. There's nothing they could say. They were just quiet. And then, and then they're like wanting to, you know, withdraw from the Sanhedrin and confer together and have all these questions and answers. They're like, what are we going to do with these people? How do we deal with them? I don't know what to do anymore. You know, they won't move out of here. You know, they're, they're over here online doing this. I'm like, we'll shadow ban them. We'll, we'll, we'll mess with their internet. You know, we'll, we'll bother them with their job. We'll show up at their home. We'll do these different things. We'll, we'll cause all these problems. But like they say in verse 16, they know a sign has happened. Have you ever met a Christian that is truly following God and you can say and share a story about a miracle that happened in their life? It was a sign from God, something that God did that only can be explained by the power of God. The end of 16, it says, everyone living in Jerusalem knows they perform a notable sign. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. I personally know what it's like to be told to stop talking about Jesus in multiple places, in the marketplace, in school. Their customs and courtesies in different countries and workplaces where you can't talk about any religion whatsoever. It's an automatic termination. There are things in the world right now that are no different than what happened then. But then they get brought in together again. They say, well, we're telling you, uh, we command you, we, we request you, uh, stop talking about Jesus. Don't teach about Jesus. And Peter and John replies and says, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you, or to you, or him, or her, or this, or that. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. So the challenge between now and the 31st of August, what have you seen and what have you heard about Jesus Christ of Nazareth today? It doesn't have to just be from what I said. It doesn't just have to be from here. What is the manifestation of Jesus Christ in social media, on Zoom, in your home, in your ministry group? As I've said before and i say it again, if we were put on trial, will we be found guilty of Jesus Christ today? But what are we? What are we doing? You know, do we need that sign? I really believe many of us do need some kind of sign, not necessarily that God is here and God's protecting us and leading us, but many of us, I do believe, need a sign to know exactly, well, what is it you want me to do? You know, where do you want me to go? What, 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 what meeting do you want me to attend? Uh, what broadcast do you want me to attend? Um, what school, what job you want me at? Um, where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to walk today? Do you want me to go to this store? 
That's not, you know, I'm not just, I don't need to make a purchase, but do you want me to go somewhere? If we're not asking the Lord these questions, we're not always going to have the answers. You can say, here am I, send me, Lord. But then you completely, you know, too busy and we're too wrapped up. We're going to fall apart and not be able to do what needs to happen. So we have to be careful. We have to be extremely careful today because if we are not careful, we're going to miss out on exactly what God wants to do and exactly where God wants to take us. I know we are filled with so much time and time is precious. But I challenge you today, God can move you as he brings the signs into our lives, as we continue to pray, we continue to search him, he will lead us on from one moment to the next. The only follower of Jesus Christ, we come before you today, we pray for Malaysia, we pray for our country, we pray for the 31st celebrations, we pray for what is happening in our life. Lord, we pray for the signs that we need in our life to know what you want us to do, how you want us to do it, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to say? What places do you want us to go? And how are we going to get there? What jobs do we need? What family members? What friends? Where we're going? So we can be an ambassador for you and all that we do. Many of us have fear. Many of us have frustrations. Many of us are not certain of what it is that you're wanting us to do. And God, we need that help today to go forward and be the hands and feet that you called us to be. Because we can't do this on our own. Our flesh is fighting our spirit. And Lord, we need help to submit this flesh daily. We want a touch of your grace. We want a touch of your love. By the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. My dear brother Jeremy Cavalry, saints, you have heard the word of God. We know Jesus wants to rule and reign in every area of your life. But will you let him in? Will you continue to pray for our nation? They say righteousness exalts a nation. And we want to exalt the name of Jesus in Malaysia. Of course, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do with what you have heard? And I pray every single person here will let Jesus rule and reign in every area of your life. He owns your 24 hours. You like it or don't like it. Like I say, you tied your time. Why don't you time tied two hours and 40 minutes every time every day and see what God will do with your days, all right? As time is running a bit, I'm going to pass over the meeting to... Uh, Sister Evie, a wonderful sister who worships in grace. She's there every morning with us, 6.30. We get up, we worship and praise the Lord. And we are very proud to have her. She's a wonderful person. She loves the Lord. And she's also ever ready, like the battery. God bless you, Sister Evie. Thank you, Pastor Romeo.